Hi everyone and welcome to the YouTube channel. In this episode, I want to cover everything I can about HMO, what it is, a house of multiple occupancy, how you can find them, why they're such a great investment, and the biggest pitfalls that people seem to make in the first couple of years and this glorified buy to let on steroids, and maybe why it's not as good as some people feel it is and how you can get involved. For those that don't know me, or maybe this is the first video of mine you've ever seen, my name's Jamie York, I'm a property investor. I've been invested in property for the last decade or almost a decade, and I've bought, refurbished, sold on and packaged hundreds of deals to hundreds of investors over the last 10 years. And I just wanna use this channel to share with you as much knowledge as possible around property, investment, and the business landscape in the UK. So if you're interested in videos like that, make sure to hit the subscribe button, and I hope you enjoy the content in this video. Okay, so first of all, what is a HMO if we just go to the board and get something up? So, I'm not an artist, okay? So this is what a HMO would apparently look like if Picasso or myself would draw it out. So a HMO is simply getting a house or a flat, but typically a house. Um, and what we're doing is instead of renting it out to a small family or a one unit uh, outgoing, what we're gonna do is split it up and rent it out by the room. So obviously you've got these exquisite looking individuals renting it out. So typically what you'll find is people rent out all of the rooms upstairs. And if it's got a front room and a lounge or whatever, um, they'll rent out one of the rooms. Okay, so they'll usually have a front room and a kitchen as the communal areas. So what are the benefits of this? Well, obviously, you're going to get increased income. So you're going to make more money and get it in the bank, theoretically. So as I said, I want to cover everything in this, including tenant demand, where to find properties, how to find them, and finally, how to do the numbers. And within all of that, I want to cover the pitfalls. So number one is tenant demand. One of the biggest mistakes I find people making is they look at the spreadsheet and you've got it in and you look at the little cells and you go, well, look at this. Yes, I'm going to make a thousand pounds a month. Tick that box. That's fantastic, right? Oh, and by the way, I'm going to get a refinance in and I'm going to pull out all of my own money and I'm going to make a thousand pounds a month, right? Amazing. So. Then they realize once they've actually got it, that is not reality at all. And in fact, what we're looking at when we're going through this is we're actually making £650 a month and on the refinance, we've left in £40,000. So it doesn't mean that that's a bad investment, but it's not the investment that we looked at originally. So let's look at tenant demand in the first place. So when we're looking at tenant demand, this is coming out of the spreadsheet and not taking it as fact, which a lot of people do with their investments and actually doing um, some research. So it's not all analytical um, data in terms of the numbers. We're looking at the real life situation. So the first thing is if you've never been to this area before, go to it. OK, you need to get the feel of the place. And I'm a big believer in remote property investing, by the way. I buy a lot of properties I've never seen. Um, I've never been to the area, but I know what to look for. And so before investing in the area, either myself or um, one of my key partners will go to view around the area to get a feel. So you'll understand the tenant type there, the demographic, what sort of properties you're dealing with and the spatial situation with the property itself. So we want to know, is there actually demand? The big problem I see is people will go and buy this property, especially up north where we are, we're in Leeds, but surrounding areas, people go and get this property and go, tell you what, we can buy that for £80,000. I realise in London that might even not be a deposit for your property, but they'll buy a property for £80,000, go, yeah, we'll spend fifty grand on that, turning it to a HMO, make all of that money, and then we'll get a capital appreciation on it or a multiplier or a commercial valuation on that and we'll refinance at 200,000. The big problem is people were relying on tenant demand, high incomes on their inflated incomes most of the time and the property is never really worth 200,000 because it's inflated by that commercial value. Really it's probably worth around 
the 130 that you put in the property. So how do we actually look for tenant demand? Well, on Rightmove, a majority of the properties are actually um, aimed at the buy-to-let market, okay? So it's not really HMOs. The two most popular sites, um, or three, let's go for three. Number one's open rent, so you can go on there. It's an open portal, so you can rent your own properties. Um, then there's Easy Roommate, and then there's Spare Room. Okay, they are websites that you can go on. And what you need to do, the best thing you can ever do, is put yourself in the tenant's shoes. So some practical examples of this is, number one, I'm looking on Easy Roommate and Spare Room, and I'm gonna place myself as a tenant looking for a property, and I wanna see how many are available. On the flip side, I'm gonna see um, how many people are looking. So if I've, there's 100 rooms available in this area that I'm thinking of going into, there's 100 rooms available, but 200 people looking, that's a really good supply and demand that we're looking at, and I'm definitely gonna look further into that. Conversely, if we're looking at a room and there's 100 rooms available, but only 50 people looking, that's really not good. Okay. Another practical uh, thing that I'd like to do, if you've got the time to actually do this research, is I would go online and find some rooms that are going to be similar to the standard that you're looking for. So hopefully a decent standard, and we'll just take the fact that you're going to be great investors and great buy-to-let landlords, or landlords in general. And I'm going to call them up and see if the room's available. And I'm looking for new listings, okay? They've just come on in the last couple of days. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check back a week later and I'm still gonna call them up or two weeks later and I'm gonna see if the rooms are available or not. If they're not, that's a really good sign that the demand's there in a very real term and real world situation. So a really interesting bit, or I think it's interesting, that I really wanna crack into is the numbers of a HMO, which I'm going to do in a moment, but a key part of that is council tax. Now you might think, well, okay, why aren't you mentioning council tax in the numbers part of this? Well, it's for a very specific reason. So if you don't know how council tax typically works, what we do is we have these bands, okay? Not like the musical bands, but bands as in A, B, C, D, E, and F. I missed out B. And then G, I think, as well. And then typically what happens, these aren't the actual numbers, by the way, but I'll go through them. They get more expensive. So six, seven, eight, nine, and a thousand. That's per year, per annum, not per month, by the way. Okay, so 600 pounds per annum for council tax. And as we said, typically with a HMO, you will be paying um, for the pleasure of all of the utilities and council tax. But here's what they're looking to do for some licensed HMOs, okay? What they're looking to do is start charging per room in band A. Now, I doubt it will be quite as bad as that. I imagine it will be a reduced rate okay, um, for each room. But the, what they're looking at doing is if you've got an ensuite in your room, a bathroom attached to your bedroom, you are likely to get charged a council uh, tax to that. So here's the issue. Option one is the landlord ends up suffering that cost. If it is around the 600 mark and it's a five bed property, suddenly instead of paying, you're probably on a, a, a C rating, which is 800 pounds per annum. If there's five now at that 600 mark, it'll probably be slightly reduced. It's now 3,000 pounds. Now that's actually a really significant portion of your profit. So that's 2,400 pounds. Let's say that takes three months of your profit in a HMO. Suddenly, instead of you making close to 10 grand a year from this one property, you're now making 7,500. Okay, well, it's money or money, right? Well, no, not if you've retired on your 10, you, uh, 10 property HMO portfolio for 100 grand a year for you and your missus or you and your fella. Now you're getting 75 grand. Okay, how does that 25,000 impact people? Quite massively, I would say. The other alternative, option B is, well, I tell you what, because of that, if you're gonna live in a room somewhere, you are in charge of paying your own council tax just as you would if you were in a buy to let. Great, how's that work out for the landlord? Well, good from a cost perspective because it's passed on to the tenant, but what about the administration nightmare? 
The reason that works for buy to lets is the average tenant's going to stay in for two to three years. Okay, great. You're having to tell them it's vacant because you're the property owner. You're the one who's in charge of telling the council who lives in the property, right? But if it's a, and the average tenant staying there for six to nine months and you've got five of those, that means you know you've got one and a quarter because nine out of 12 months or one and a third times that by five you're looking at 6.5 times a year that might not make sense putting 0.5 but as it goes over the years it builds up right so let's say six six times a year you're getting in touch with the council to let them know that tenant's not there now is vacant now let's assume you actually want to get that tenanted obviously so that 6.5 doubles 13 times because the tenant leaves you have to update the council to say it's um, it's vacant what happens then you have to take on that cost so now that void period isn't just the bills and the mortgage it's now council tax to you but it's also that admin time then you want to rent it to dave down the road dave moves in now you have to update them that dave um, has moved in but guess what happens is the council great and well known for speed just like solicitors absolutely not for both obviously so then what happens is actually you're paying for all that time that they're processing the fact that Dave's in there and then they will pay you back at some point down to them. Admin nightmare, okay? We don't know what it's gonna be, but this is something to consider with ensuite properties, um, bedrooms in the property and your HMO, and is it going to be licensed? Because I imagine when, and it is when this does roll out, it will be on licensed houses of multiple occupancy. So, talking about licensing, so does every property need a HMO license? No, it doesn't. Um, however, that's just right now. So it used to be if it's a five bedroom property with three or more um, unrelated individuals in a property over three floors, or more so it had to if it was a two level property you didn't need it you would need a hmo license now it's changed to a five bedroom property anywhere um, that is over two floors just irrespective of the level of floors that you need a license and if you're in an article four area which i'll describe in a moment then you need a hmo license so why is this important well one you need to factor in the extra cost of that so hmo license is going to be around 800 pounds okay but it's not just the hmo license that you need you need to be in line with hmo regulations okay and if you've got a license there's the smoke detectors there's the types of doors there's the locks in there and the ongoing maintenance and checks that you need to do that so i personally think averaged out over a lifespan you're looking at another one thousand pounds per annum of extra costs within that it's all chipping away on these great returns that you're looking at right now the issue is article four what is it in the UK, we have something called permitted development, which is basically the government going, yeah, crack on, do what you need to do um, in terms of altering things. So you might need planning, for example. No, you can crack on with certain things. Permitted development. Article 4 is giving the local council power to go, and I'll keep this as simple as possible, I know there's permitted development, but I also don't give a crap. You have to come to us and get approval for doing this. And in a lot of areas where there's Article 4, it's basically, oh, you want another HMO. How many are on the street? Oh, there's 20 out of 100, or it's usually around 25% in my area, but it changes area to area. Oh yeah, I know you have permitted development rights to do a HMO, but no, you can't do it. Now that's really important because there's a lot of newbie investors that purchase a property and just assume they can do this and rent out five rooms only to find out actually no you're doing that illegally you're not able to do that and you can only run it as a buy to let oh but i paid 20 grand extra for this property because i thought i could just naturally assumed i'd be able to get that no you can't okay so looking at this licensed area is really important um, to factor this in, which is why a lot of the time the five bedroom seems to be quite typical, but actually in a lot of areas, you're better having it as a four bedroom, which I'll talk through in a moment why, rather than a five bedroom and getting that extra licensing cost. So if you are going to get the license, not in all areas, I'd have to look at a very specific example, you're better off going into the six bed territory 
because you're going to factor in the extra cost of that licensing and warrant the extra uplift in profits. Uh, at five bed, it's really difficult. So what you do have with this is something called a minimo. So a minimo is just a dub term. It's still a HMO. Okay, a house of multiple occupancy, but now we've got four rooms that wouldn't look anything like this. This was a terrible idea drawing these people, but you've got these four people in the four rooms um, that we go into. For some reason, there's no kitchen, bathroom or anything in this property, but you would need those in yours. So by doing this currently, there's no planning needed and there's no licensing needed. And there are some lenders on the buy to let mortgage that will make this available on this, okay? So without all of those licensing expenses on there, it's sometimes better to get a four bed without having to stick to every single regulation that you would if you were uh, licensed. Um, but it makes it available at a much cheaper price. So you're actually making less revenue or less turnover but more property uh, profit within the property, okay? So that's something to think about. However, I would actively encourage every single one of you that even if you don't need a license, I'd try to do your refurbishment as close to the requirements as possible because one, you know, you want to make sure your tenant safety is of the highest priority when you're doing this. And two, I'd always like to protect myself. The last thing I want to do is the rules change, which in the property sector is happening all the time right now. Um, and I'd want to make sure my HMO, my house of multiple occupancy, is as compliant as possible from day one. OK, so let's look at the numbers. Money, this is what we're interested in, right? So when you're doing this comparison, a big mistake people make is they look at these vanity metrics rather than the key metrics that we actually want to use, the cash in our pocket. So if we look at a bite alert, what we'll typically do is we'll look at the vanity metric and they'll go 800 pounds a month. Oh yeah, but you've got your costs, you know, your mortgage, your maintenance, your voyage, your management, etc. So very roughly, let's say you're getting, let's say 450 pounds in the bank account. But let's look at HMO. Why wouldn't we convert this to a HMO, right? Well, if we go over here and look at this HMO, you might go, well, there's five bedrooms, right? Now, more than likely, this will end up better financially for the investment, but there's other things to consider. Well, this five bed, first of all, is gonna cost about 50 grand, average 10,000 pound per room, if you wanna do really rough conversion costs, by the way, for a HMO, 10,000 pound per room. So we're looking at a 50K refurb that we're doing instead of on this side, let's say a 20K refurb, and it really can be that different, by the way through the conversion and we're going to rent it out at instead of 800 pounds for the whole thing 500 pounds a room amazing right so we've got 500 rooms a pound a room five rooms that's 2500s right amazing right do you want 800 pounds a month 9600 pounds a year or do you want 2500 pound a month and you want 30000 pound a year let me know in the comments what one's better for you 2500 or 800 Pretty obvious, right? But it's not that simple. So if we look at this, first of all, what we're gonna be looking at is these initial costs here. So you notice it's 800 to 450. That's a 350 pound drop, which is gonna be some management breakdown expenses. So first of all, you've got your lending. Lending is not the same, okay? Uh, in buy to let, you get 75% loan to value, which means if it's 100,000 pounds, 75,000 is gonna come from a bank and 25,000 pound has to come from your back pocket. For a HMO or commercial, most of the time, and there are caveats to this, so talk to your financial advisor or your broker about this, but normally you are not going to get 75% loan to value. Number two, you have to be more experienced to even get this sort of lending. So you have to be an experienced landlord for usually a year minimum, and the costs are going to be a lot higher. But let's say we're looking at lending on this property of probably about 500 pounds, we're then gonna look at the additional insurances and bits like that, and your utilities and your council tax. Roughly, we're working that out as about 100 pounds a room. So we've got five rooms, 500 pounds gonna be costing the, uh, covering the costs of the property. So utilities, council tax, insurance, bits like that. And then what you've got is the voids Okay, which people don't seem to want to take account of, but the voids and the maintenance within this. 
personally, I think you're going to be looking at about 20% for all of that, okay, for the ongoing maintenance um, and the voids uh, and the management as well. So that's being generous, by the way. That is being very generous. So we're looking at 500 pounds. And, you know, the reason why for that is actually that management's going to be pretty poor and they're going to charge you more for it. If you're self-managing your property, yes, it's a load more effort and I don't recommend self-managing, by the way. But if you do, you've got your property. You only care about filling that property. You can be proactive on the phones about filling that property. When a tenant's got a problem, you're only dealing with that tenant's problem. If you're a management agent, you might have a hundred units to fill. So you don't really care that they go into that property. You care that they go into a property and that you are getting paid for that as a management fee. Okay. So you are going to have additional costs within this that are unforeseeable. Um, people suddenly leaving. So let's take account of another, let's say 200 pounds for that because it's not broken down as such. So what we're looking at with that is 500, 500, 500 and 200, we're looking at 1,700, okay? So we're looking at 1,700 of overall cost to come off of that 2,500 pounds. 2,500 minus the 1,700, we are looking at an overall value of 800 pounds, okay? Now, obviously, there'll be some bits out. This is just quick numbers on this, but 800 pounds is definitely better than 450 pounds. But then you need to take account of the added money in, the added refurb, the delays in the added refurb. If you need it licensed, which you will for that five bed, the added cost of that taken account, which probably is covered in that 200 pounds, and the fact that managing five people um, that are typically around the age of 25 to 30, different personalities, bickering, all of that sort of thing. Suddenly, I would understand how somebody would forego the extra 350 pounds for the buy to let. So I'm not saying this is better, by the way. Um, I think HMOs are great. I've invested in rent to rents myself. I've invested in HMOs myself. I love them. They make amazing amounts of money, but you need to make sure you've got that right tenant demand. You understand the tenant type. You really understand your numbers. Does it need to be licensed? Does it, is it in an article four area? And then compare those situations. And for you, is the extra in this scenario 350 pounds worth the extra effort to you. And that's 4,200 a year. You know, if you've got 10 properties and you're comparing this against the HMO, that's an extra 42,000 pounds a year um, of buffer to take account of. So for me, if you've got a great management team in place, this is a no brainer for the right property. But the final tip I will give you with this is if it all went tits up, and it wasn't working as a HMO and a new rule come in, if you had to turn it back into a buy to let property, would it still make sense to you? So guys, I really hope you enjoyed that video. It is by no means a full deep dive into every single section, which I will be doing videos to, by the way, and I'll create a playlist around this. But if you're interested in finding out more about HMOs, property, investment, and business, make sure to like the video and leave a comment what you thought below. And of course, remember to hit the subscribe button that side and hit the notification bell as well and I'll send you a notification once the rest of the HMO videos are done so you can watch them all together as a collective and make sure you've got an all-round education around this. Hope you enjoyed that and of course we'll see you this Friday in the next business video and I'll see you there. Oh, really? Stop it! Yeah. Stop it you guys! over more than two fourths to blah, 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 blah. Sorry about that. Why am I so camp? <laughs> okay, so a really big thing that I want to crack into, which I'm going to in a moment, is the numbers. But a really big part of that that you really do need to be aware of is council tax. Council tax.